Hey friends, welcome back to the one year Bible journey, especially for beginners. I'm Pastor Kerry, and this is Growing in the Gospel, and today we are in week 16. So again, I congratulate you for staying with the class and the program and for journeying forward. I want to encourage you uh, to stay on the journey. You're almost one third of the way there now, so there's no turning back at this point. We are well on our way through God's Word, and uh, I'm glad you're taking the journey with me. So today we're going to talk about the New Testament reading for this week. We talked yesterday about Judges 21 to 1 Samuel 10. A lot there, amazing part of God's Word, the redemptive story moving forward out of dark times. The New Testament reading for this week is, uh, is the brightest of times. It's the light is dawning on the people that walked in darkness. So we're back in in the life of Jesus, John chapter 3 through John chapter 7. And I'm just going to try to briefly give you your bearings because John's gospel is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so far you've read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're going to read some stuff today, this week, that isn't in any of the other gospels. And we're going to be able to synchronize these narratives. So let me give you a little bit of a sense of where you are in the timeline of Jesus. Well, in John 3, 4, five, you're still relatively early in the life and ministry of Jesus, especially in chapters three and four. You're within the first six to eight months of a Jesus ministry. Chapter five is kind of a nondescript moment. Uh, we don't know which feast it was or in the period of three and a half years. It's somewhere in the middle of the ministry of Jesus. When you get to chapter six, you need to kind of make a mental note here. You are coming into the last a year or so of Jesus' ministry. We'll get to that in a few minutes. You're coming towards the end. And when you get to chapter 7, we're moving quickly towards the end of Jesus' ministry. It isn't amazing how John's gospel touches on just a few key places in the early ministry of Jesus. And then uh, chapter 7 and forward is the last seven months. And really, when you get to chapters 11 and 12, it's the last week. And the very last half, the back, the back half of the book of John is all zoomed in to the very last week and especially the last night of the life of Jesus coming into the resurrection. So, so anyway, when you pick up chapter three, Jesus is in Jerusalem and the entire chapter, really most of the chapter focuses on an interaction with a religious leader named Nicodemus. At this point, Nicodemus is watching Jesus. He's one of very few religious leaders who becomes a believer in Jesus, but he's conflicted. He's politically conflicted because he, he's a part of this body that that knows who Jesus is as Messiah, but rejects him. So he is torn. If he leaves this body to follow Jesus, he loses everything. Uh, but if he stays in this body, he's conflicted, be, this, this leadership body of, of leaders and elders, because he knows he has a growing knowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. And in this chapter, it's early on in the story of Nicodemus, where Nicodemus is trying to sort all this out. And it's an amazing chapter about new birth. It's where we learn the most about what it means to be born again. So Jesus teaches about new birth and essentially is calling Nicodemus to that new birth, persuading him that he needs that new birth. Um, so Jesus in, in the early part of the chapter, he's interacting with Nicodemus, and we read that famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John three sixteen. The last part of the chapter, Jesus is still in the southern part of the country, Judea, and he, he takes some time to go out into the hills of Judea. He's preaching the gospel, they're baptizing, but he's also interacting a little bit with the, the ministry of John the Baptist, and it's kind of a handoff. John the Baptist's ministry is coming to a close, and Jesus' ministry is ramping up, and uh, so that's a, a moment there. Chapter 4, it's time to go back to Galilee. So again, this is early. Again, I say the first six to eight months of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's going to now move north. Instead of going down to the Jordan River Valley and going north to Galilee, he goes up through the hill country. It's the hardest journey, hardest way to go, but he has an appointment. He goes through Samaria, which there's a lot of racial tensions with Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans really despise each other. They don't really interact, 
But Jesus has an appointment at a well, Jacob's well. He goes to Shechem. He goes to where Jacob, um, he goes to the land of Jacob and the land of Joseph and the sons of Jacob. He goes back to that special well and he meets this Samaritan woman at the well. It's a beautiful account. It's a beautiful um, interaction and and a moment of her salvation, of her placing faith in the source of living water, Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, It's a great story. It's an amazing account of Jesus getting the gospel to the people of Samaria. He uses this woman who becomes essentially the first evangelist to the region of Samaria. She goes and tells everybody what happened to her, and they all come out to meet Jesus. The disciples are witnessing all this. They don't know what to make of this because it's culturally complicated. You know, Jesus is is getting the gospel to these people. The disciples are thinking these people are uh, not are not chosen ones. They're not uh, God's people like we are. So it's the early iterations of the disciples learning that the gospel is going to go to everybody. It's it's just a an, an amazing amazing chapter. Um, so then. Chapter five, Jesus, uh, oh, oh, the end of chapter four, I need to tell you this too. He gets back to Galilee, goes back to Cana, and he's approached by a nobleman who wants him to come and heal his son. This nobleman is from Capernaum, and Jesus does the healing and tells the man, go back home, and there's this incredible moment of faith where this nobleman has the authority to bind up Jesus and force him to come to Capernaum to heal, but he doesn't do that. And there's this moment of truth where we're going to understand this nobleman's faith, and that is when Jesus says, go home, your son is made whole. This, this man makes a decision, is he, and we see the decision in this. Is he going to bind up Jesus as a nobleman and force him to come to Capernaum, or is he going to trust Jesus and take him at his word and go home without him? And the life of his son seemingly hangs in the balance. This man decides to trust Jesus and obey Jesus. And we see it most expressed when he leaves. He goes home. He doesn't take matters into his own hands. He goes home. He's met halfway by his servants who tell him, your son is healed. And he realizes that Jesus kept his word and did exactly what he promised. It's a wonderful story, a great story. So now Jesus is back in Galilee and he home bases now in Capernaum, and John is going to skip a lot of time, a lot of healing, a lot of stuff that we've already read in the other Gospels, John skips over. Chapter 5 kind of is a standalone chapter where Jesus goes into town for a unidentified feast. It's one of the feasts of, of the Jews. He goes directly to the poorest part of town, to the Pool of Bethesda. He heals a lame man. It's a stark uh, moment, and he is now... Um, approached by religious leaders who accuse him of breaking the law. And we see some of those interactions that we've seen in other gospels of religious leaders now confronting Jesus for healing on the Sabbath and rejecting him as Messiah, rejecting his authority and beginning to despise him and planning and plotting his death. So we see the boiling tensions rising up and and the temperature rising. When you turn to chapter six, Jesus is back in Capernaum and A lot of time has gone by, and a lot of healing has happened. A lot of ministry has happened in Galilee during this time. Chapter 6, John identifies this chapter because it's kind of the culmination of his ministry in Capernaum. And it's the feeding of the 5,000 on the hillsides outside of Bethsaida. So Jesus gets into a boat at Capernaum, which is on the north shore of Galilee. He goes about four miles across the water. It's across the northern tip of the sea over to Bethsaida, which is on the northwest, no, northeast side of the lake and up into the low hill country there. Jesus goes to get away, but the crowds follow him. He teaches them and heals them all day long. And the day is wearing on. And and then we come into the story of the feeding of the 5,000. He asks Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? I love this story because Jesus already knows what he's going to do. The disciples have been watching him do all these miracles, but for some reason, like me, they just have amnesia. They forget all the times that God saved them, God rescued, God healed, God blessed. And um, and so Jesus saves the day again, and he distributes bread to all these people, and he feeds them. They want to force him now to be the king. 
wouldn't you? Free food, free electricity, free gas, free everything, all debts erased, mortgages, no, all your mortgage payments are gone. I mean, like, they want to force him to be their geopolitical king, but that's not why he came. He came to redeem. He came to die. He came the first time as a suffering Messiah. And so he doesn't allow them to force him to be the king. He did the feeding of the 5,000 for an object lesson. He sends the disciples back to Capernaum in a boat at night. They get stuck in a storm. He comes walking on the water to them. Uh, Peter walks on the water. John leaves that out of his account. I think that's hilarious because Peter and John were always a little bit competitive towards each other. Um, and and then they end up after the, the night's over and the storm is over, Jesus calms the storm. They're right back at Capernaum. So it's an amazing night. It's an amazing miracle feeding of 5,000, amazing night of Jesus meeting the disciples in the, in, the, in the storm. And I love that account of Jesus meeting us in our storms, Jesus in control of our storms, Jesus not wanting us to be afraid in our storms. The crowds he has sent away, they've all returned home, have returned across the lake to their various areas. And Jesus, at the end of chapter 6, goes into the synagogue at Capernaum. It's a very poignant moment because it's it's like a gauntlet. It's like a gauntlet. It's like a watershed moment. It's this catalyst, catalyst moment of believe or not. And he uses the miracle of the feeding to then go into the synagogue and teach that he is a kind of spiritual bread, that he is a kind of spiritual food. And anyone that doesn't consume him by faith receive him, trust him, place all their faith in him. The idea of consuming him is a figurative one. It's a metaphor. We don't really believe that you take communion, you you eat the wafer, you drink the, the juice or the wine, and that it becomes the body and blood of Jesus. That's heresy. That's false teaching. No, it's a metaphor of faith. We faith Jesus and he comes into us. He takes up residence in our lives that we need a new birth. It's building on the idea of a new identity, a new birth, a new creation that we need to take what Jesus has done and the person of Jesus and the spirit of God into ourselves by faith and we need to be made new and it is the it is Jesus alone that does that miracle. Well, when Jesus teaches this in the synagogue at Capernaum, the people really struggle with this teaching They want him to be the king. Uh, They want a Messiah on their terms. And so you're going to read this critical moment in chapter 6 where many reject Jesus. Many walk away. In fact, you get the sense that it's at the synagogue in in Capernaum, and I've been there. You could go there uh, on, on our trips. We go into the synagogue and we talk about this story. The people walk away. All these throngs of people that he's healed and that have seen this great light for now the better part of two years in Capernaum, they throw their hands up and they're like, well, who can can abide by this? Who can accept this? This is a hard teaching. And they walk away. And Jesus is in the synagogue and it's just him and his disciples. And it's kind of a sad moment and they would have been sad because of it. Uh, Not Jesus, but the disciples. Nothing surprises Jesus. The disciples are feeling like he's destroying the movement, you know. Um, we're supposed to be rescuing Israel and Israel, and Jesus is teaching these hard things and people are giving up and walking away and rejecting him. And Jesus looks at them and says, are you also going to go away? And they say, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so this teaching kind of, kind of is a division point in the ministry of Jesus. And when you pick up the narrative in chapter 7, it says Jesus walked in Galilee. It's the Gentile part of Galilee because the Jews rejected him at this point. And he, and he pronounces judgment on these cities, uh, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin, because of all that they'd seen and that they rejected him. And when you, you need to, re- to know this, I'm just going to insert this. At the end of chapter 6, seven months go by before you open up chapter 7. And you're reading, you just need to kind of understand this. At the opening of chapter 6, a long period of time has gone by of miracles after miracle in Capernaum and in the region, teachings of Capernaum, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, all that has happened. The feeding of the 5,000 now is kind of the culmination of the ministry in Capernaum, the ministry to the Jewish people of Galilee and all the villages of Galilee. And this teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum 
is kind of this, this final moment where many people reject. And now there's seven months. During the seven months, Jesus goes to Tyre and Sidon. He goes up to Caesarea Philippi, the gates of hell. He teaches the disciples that the movement is not dying. He's going to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's teaching them that it's bigger than they know and that even though people are walking away, it's just beginning. And he begins to teach them about his coming death. So seven months go by, and when you open chapter 7, there's been a seven-month gap, and here's, here's the other thing you need to know. Chapter 7 begins this long moment that's going to span three chapters in the Gospel of John of Jesus going to a feast in Jerusalem. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. I like to call it the Festival of Tents because tabernacle means tent, and the feasts were festivals in Jerusalem. So our modern day sense of a festival is still alive. So contextually, we can process it a little better if we think of a festival. Um, in, in New England, in September and October, every town and village and, and population center has some kind of festival, some kind of fall festival. There's arts festivals, there's crafts festivals, there's food festivals, there's local towns and villages all across New England having their, their September and October thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a New England huge fair called the Big E, and it happens in Springfield, Massachusetts, and there's representations of every state, and there's lots of good food and rides and shows and and attractions and animals and crafts and booths and stores. And it's it's just a big kind of end of summer, beginning of fall, end of fall, whatever, festival celebration before the weather gets bad again. Um, so the Festival of Tents is a fall festival in Jerusalem. It's one of the biggest celebrations of the year. It's the coming to the end of the harvest season. People are bringing their offerings. They're bringing their families. It is a massive homecoming, family reunion, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people are coming to Israel. They're camping. And here's how cool God is. He tells all the families to bring tents, set them up on the hills all around Jerusalem. And they live in this these little tents for the entire uh, duration of the festival. That's why it's called the Festival of Tents. It was, it was to commemorate God bringing the people through the wilderness where they lived in tents. But more than that, it's, it's to commemorate our pilgrimage. We are people on a journey in a pilgrimage going to the city of God on our own pilgrimage. And as believers, our destiny is the city of God, like Jerusalem was their city of God. But it just shows the festive nature of God, the jubilant heart of God and the familial heart of God that he wants his people to come together. He's blessed them with their harvest. They're going to bring their offerings they're going to celebrate the abundance and the blessing and the goodness of God. And they bring their offerings and their sacrifices. And then God says, now stay in town and eat all these offerings, eat all these sacrifices for the next week. And they feast and feast and feast for a week and they enjoy it. And it's wonderful. So Jesus is going to use this feast to reveal that the feast is all about him. So he goes at the middle of the feast and you're going to read in chapter seven, this moment of confrontation in the middle of the feast where he's going to present himself as the God-man. He's going to claim, he's going to make no ambiguous claim that he is God visiting the feast. He is the son of God. He is the savior. And at the very end of the feast, he's going to do something remarkable. This is where we read of Jesus being uh, the spring of living water and whosoever comes to me will drink of living water, and I will put a spring of living water within him that will flow up out of him and to, and to be a source of life and, and, and living uh, forever and ever and ever, everlasting life, an everlasting water, an everlasting source of life. Now, I want you to know this. It's so powerful. There was this, there was this ceremony at the end of the feast to close the feast where they would, the, the people would come out in the morning and they would follow the processional, a, a priest, the, the priest would take a, a, a vessel and they would 
proceed out of the Temple Mount, down out of the city, down the processional staircase to the Pool of Siloam. This is where everybody washed when they came into the city, the Pool of Siloam. And the, the priest would fill the vessel with water, and then they would proceed back up the staircase, up to Temple Mount, and they would go to the altar with this vessel, and they would pour the water on the altar And it was a way of saying God has been our source of life. God has been our source of water and food and provision. And this moment would have been dense with population, dense with joy. It would have just been a massive throng of people in this processional following the priest up to the pouring out of the water. When that ceremony is over, Jesus stands up at that altar in the center of of all of this population of people, massive throngs of people, and he declares. He makes a massive declaration. And I'm pulling it up here. So verse 37 of chapter 7, in the last day, that great day of the feast, okay, that moment, that ceremony, that culmination. Think of this as the fireworks show on 4th of July or the end of the end of the day at Disney World when everybody gathers around the castle for the fireworks or some big moment that culminates the final moment of a big moment. That's what this is. And he stands up and he cried. The word cried is he shouts with a loud voice, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What Jesus does is profound. He stands up and points to this water and says, this is me. This whole feast is me. If any man comes to me and drinks, if you will believe in me, I'm going to do this living water thing in you. It's massive. And at this point, many people believe in him And many people despise him. The religious leaders despise him, but many people begin to follow him. So, like I said, this is the last seven months of Jesus' ministry. So the temperature is increasing towards the crucifixion. And it is just a very, very critical moment. This moment of the feast, chapter 8 and 9, continue out of this moment. So John is going to really highlight this major moment of this feast of tents in Jerusalem where Jesus is identifying himself and calling people to believe. So great reading this week, John 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, amazing passages of scripture that follow on an amazing Old Testament reading. So in the comments, share what you're learning, share questions that you might have, and uh, explain, share with me what God's doing in your life as we take this journey together because Uh, This is marvelous. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Jesus is on his way to the cross. As you close chapter seven, he is seven months from the crucifixion. We're in about October. He's going to be crucified in the spring. So it's all coming to a grand conclusion. Hey, thanks for taking the one year Bible journey with me. I hope that this is blessing you and strengthening you and equipping you and encouraging you. I'm praying for you all and I will see you tomorrow in Psalm 119.